Hello, in this video we'll be talking about chemical equilibrium. Now equilibrium basically means balance. And um, in physics you must have learned about two types of equilibrium called um, static and dynamic equilibrium. So chemical equilibrium is a type of dynamic equilibrium. Now chemical equilibrium applies to a set of reactions that we refer to as reversible reactions. A reversible reaction is represented as something like this. You have that kind of arrow in it. If the arrow is not represented that way, it could be represented this way or in some cases like that. So all of those are reversibility signs. But this is not the reversibility sign. Instead, this indicates resonance. So any of these symbols can be used to represent reversibility. Now what does it mean to say a reaction is reversible? This reaction is reversible in the sense that if I take a reaction vessel and I put A and B into it, A and B would react, of course, to form C and D. But unlike in this case, see this case, A plus B to form C plus D. If I put A and B into a reaction vessel for an irreversible reaction like this one, by the end of the reaction, I'll have no more A, no more B. All I'll have left will be C and D. So in that case, A and B are called reactants, whereas C and D are called products. However, in this case, I put A and B into a reaction vessel. As they react to form C and D, the C and D produced will also keep, um, keep reacting to form back A and B. So it's a two-way reaction, actually. There are two reactions in this one. The first is the reaction where A and B form C and D. And then the second is the reaction where C and D form back A and B. Now note the following. First, it's not like this forward reaction will completely occur before the other reaction begins. Both reactions will occur at the same time they occur exactly at the same time as one is going on the other is also going on so this reaction where a and b form c and d we refer to it as the forward reaction then the one where c and d form a and b we call it the backward reaction as two components of the reversible reaction now it's important that you note that in this forward reaction, A and B will be called reactants, while C and D are products. Whereas in the backward reaction, C and D are called reactants, while A and B are called products. It's also important to mention that equilibrium can be achieved by any of these two routes. What I mean, or what I'm trying to say is, I could put A and B into a container, and after some time, I have A, B, C, and D in the container. But it's also true that if I put C and D into a container, after some time, I would have C, D, A, B in the container. So it doesn't matter which reaction starts first. The fact is that both reactions will occur, and they will occur at the same time. But here's a big point, a very important point. If I put A and B into the container, they will react very rapidly to form C and D. Whereas when C and D are forming A and B, they will do so slowly. Why? Because there is a large excess of A and B at the start of the reaction. And remember, I didn't put in any C or D. So the C and D concentrations are low in the beginning, whereas those of A and B are high. So the high concentrations of A and B tells us why they are able to react that rapidly. But as the reaction progresses, A and B tend to slow down in their rate of reaction. That's because their concentrations begin to drop. Whereas C and D begin to react faster as their concentration rises. 
So it's as though we are looking at two processes where you have one here and you have the other one there. And as one is dropping, the other is rising. So that after some time, what do we observe? They meet, they become equal. That point where the rate of the forward reaction becomes equal to the rate of the backward reaction is called the equilibrium point. So what does it mean for a reversible reaction to attain equilibrium? It simply means that in that reversible reaction, the rate of the forward reaction has become equal to the rate of the backward reaction. I didn't talk about quantities. I didn't say when amount of reactants and products become the same. Instead, I talked about rate. When the rate of the forward becomes equal to the rate of the backward, then we say that the reaction has reached equilibrium. So that's what it means to attain equilibrium in a reversible reaction. Now, if a reaction begins, and like we said before, the forward is faster than the backward. But after some time, both of them become equal in rates. I mean, the forward and the backward reaction become equal in rates. And we see equilibrium has been attained. Is it possible for that equilibrium to be lost? Like, is there anything that can happen that will make the equilibrium you know, go lost. When I say the equilibrium is lost, of course, if you know what equilibrium means, we said to be in equilibrium means that both rates are the same. So if we're talking about equilibrium being lost now, we're talking about one of the reactions becoming faster. So back to the question, can equilibrium be lost after it has been attained? Yes. That, in fact, is what Henri Le Chatelier tried to explain to us in his famous principle. So we know of the Le Chatelier's principle. And in stating this principle, Le Chatelier told us that there are three common factors, a change in concentration, a change in temperature, and a change in pressure. And he said that if any of these is imposed on this system that is already in equilibrium, that the equilibrium will be lost but will later be restored. In other words, if you impose any of these three factors on this reaction, it's either the forward becomes faster for a while or the backward becomes faster again. So if one of them becomes faster, we say that one has been favored. For example, assuming I had this reaction and I suddenly raised the temperature. And because of that rise in temperature, the forward reaction begins to proceed faster than the backward reaction. How would I report that? I would say that that increase in temperature has favored the forward reaction. So favors the forward reaction means the forward reaction becomes faster than the backward reaction. So at that point, you can tell what it means to say it favors the backward reaction. Yes, the backward reaction becomes faster. However, however, if I don't want to say favors the forward reaction, I could also say equilibrium shifts to the right and then favors the backward reaction that can be reported as equilibrium shifts to the left so those are two ways of reporting the same thing in each case now having mentioned those i will talk about these letter telia principal um, factors the three of them there i'll tell you how they affect a reversible reaction so we'll do that right away and then when we're done with that, we'll talk about the law of mass action and how to write equilibrium constants. But there will be a second video on chemical equilibrium where I'll do calculations on chemical equilibrium. But for this first video, I'm going to tell us now about the letter to their factors and then talk about the law of mass action as stated by Cato Goldberg and Peter Wage. So let's talk about the letter factors. The first one is a change in concentration. 
How does that work? You have this reaction A plus B to give C plus D. Now in this reaction, these are reactants and those are products. To understand or to easily tell what happens when we change concentration, I would like us to make a simple assumption, which is not true. It's just an assumption to help us. The assumption is that on the reactant side we have 1000 units and on the product side we have 1000 units and that's the mean of equilibrium an assumption not true so this is equilibrium 1000 1000 now according to letter telia if you alter concentration equilibrium will be lost but will later return so imagine that i add 200 units of a to the equilibrium mixture this is equilibrium, 1,000, 1,000. What will happen if I add 200 here? I will have 1, 2, and 1,000. Has equilibrium been lost? Yes, according to Le Chatelier. 1, 2, 1,000. But how can this equilibrium be restored? The only way it can be restored from what we are seeing now is for 100 units to shift from here to that side. So that is 100, shifting that way, so that I have 1,1 one, one and 1,1. One, one. Equilibrium has been restored. But how was the equilibrium restored? By way of 100 shifting to the right. Do you agree? So in that case, we would say that equilibrium has shifted to the right as a result of the addition of 200 units here if you don't want to say equilibrium shifts to the right you say it favors the forward reaction and that should remind you of how this reaction started at the beginning of this reaction we said we had plenty of a and b compared to c and d so the bulk of a and b that we had was the reason the forward reaction was faster at first. So similarly, adding to A or adding to B, once you add to the reactant side, this side becomes bigger again, and that means the forward reaction will become faster again. What do you think will be the effect of removing from the product side? We have seen what it means to add to reactant side. What about removing 400 from here? What will be the effect? Will equilibrium be lost? Yes. So how can we restore equilibrium? It's by taking 200 from here and shifting it to that side. So that gives us 800, 800. So how have I restored equilibrium now? By shifting some of the reactants to the product side. Equilibrium has shifted to the right, or you say it favors the forward reaction. In summary, whatever makes the left hand side bigger will favor the forward reaction, and whatever makes the right hand side bigger will favor the backward reaction. But what can make the left bigger? Two things adding to that left will make it bigger. Removing from the right will also make the left bigger. Then what can make the right bigger? Adding to that right or removing from the left. But in any case, once the left becomes bigger, you favor it forward because part of it needs to be given to the right. And once the right becomes bigger, you favor the backward reaction because part of the right has to go to the left. So that's about a change in concentration. So if you are asked in any exam, you are given something like this and they say, what is the effect of adding some C? You simply ask yourself, if I add some C, which side will become bigger, right side or left side? In this case, we say it will be right side. And when right side becomes bigger, what should follow? Part of the materials from the right should shift to the left. So equilibrium shifts to the left, or you say it favors the backward reaction. On the other hand, we have effect of a change in temperature. Now for change in temperature, look at this. Let's say you are given again A plus B to give C plus D. 
Then here they put delta H equals minus X kilojoule per mole. Look at this reaction. Delta H is negative for this reaction. Now we know that delta H is used to represent enthalpy. So let's do it this way. Remember that some reactions are endothermic while some others are exothermic. What's the difference between an endothermic and an exothermic reaction? Endo loves heat. But exo dislikes heat. How do I mean? An endothermic reaction, like we know, is a reaction that proceeds while absorbing heat from the surroundings. It is taking in heat, so it must like heat. But the exothermic reaction is the one that proceeds while losing heat to the surroundings. So that reaction doesn't like heat. So that if you look at a reaction written like this, the delta H given here as negative, we know that stands for exothermic. But please bear in mind that there are two reactions here, and this delta H negative exothermic is only for the forward reaction. For the backward reaction, delta H is actually positive, which means whenever the forward is exo, the backward will be endo. And when the forward is endo, the backward will be exo. But the information given to us here at the end of an equation is usually the delta H of the forward. So in this case, delta H forward is negative. That means the forward is exo and the backward is endo. Now I can imagine that I am asked in an exam, what will be the effect of lowering? Sorry, that's pressure now. Let's even use increasing. What's the effect of increasing the temperature of this reaction? How do we increase temperature? Is it by adding heat or by removing heat? By adding heat. Increasing the temperature therefore means adding heat. And if you were to add heat, would you favor endo or exo? You would favor the one that likes heat, which is endo. So where is endo on this reaction? Forward or backward? Forward is exo. So endo must be backward. Therefore, increasing the temperature favors endo, which is the backward reaction. So what about a decrease in temperature? Of course, it's the opposite. If you decrease temperature, it means you'd be removing heat. And as you are removing heat, endo is unhappy. It favors exo. And where is exo on this reaction? Exo is forward. So decreasing the temperature will favor the forward reaction. Just remember, please, that exothermic reactions dislike heat and they will be favored by a decrease in temperature, whereas endothermic reactions love heat and will be favored by an increase in temperature. So anytime you get these temperature questions for Le Chatelier's principle, Always remember that the delta H given here is for the forward reaction and that of the backward reaction will be the opposite in symbol. Then, the one I'm going to tell you about next is a um, change in pressure. Effect of a change in pressure. For a change in pressure to affect a reaction, like equilibrium position, change in pressure, there are two conditions that must be met first. One of them is the reaction must contain gas. It's not true that everything in the reaction must be in the gaseous state, even if we have just one gas, like this case. See this case? CaCO3, solid. When heated, will become CaO, solid, plus CO2, gas. The fact is that there's a gas in this reaction. It doesn't have to be gas all true. That gas is sufficient for pressure changes to have an effect on the equilibrium position. Then, apart from the fact that there should be gas, the gas volumes on both sides should be unequal. That is, the quantity of gas on the left, in terms of volume or number of moles, 
should be different from the quantity of gas on the right. Like in this case, in this case, the first condition has been satisfied in that there is gas present. Then the second condition has also been satisfied. How? On the right, I have one mole of gas. On the left, there is no gas at all. So if I compare the amount of gas on both sides of the equation, I have zero on the left, one on the right. That's unequal. The two of them are not equal. So a change in pressure would definitely have effect. So once these two conditions have been met, a change in pressure will have effect. Now look at this reaction. H2 gas, Cl2 gas, to HCl gas. If we're given this reaction, we'll say we have one mole of hydrogen gas and one mole of chlorine gas, which means two moles of gas on the left. But on the right, we also have two moles of gas. So this equation satisfies the first condition in that it has gas but does not satisfy the second condition because total number of moles of gas on the left is 2 and on the right it's 2. They are equal. We said it should be unequal. So this will not be affected by a change in pressure. Look at these two equations finally. They will help us um, answer the question of what happens when pressure changes. So look at this. This is the first one, gas, gas, and gas. Then the second one is N2O4 gas becoming 2NO2 gas. Beautiful. Look at these two reactions. The question in each case is, what is the effect of raising the pressure? I'll simply tell you that when you raise pressure, it will favor a decrease in volume. When you raise pressure, it favors a decrease in volume. It means that whenever I am asked a question on lowering of pressure, I will simply realize that it will favor an increase in volume. So I'll go to the equation given to me and I'll look for an increase in volume or decrease in volume as the case may be. But in this case, the question has been set already. Increase in pressure. That's what we are looking for. Like what will be the effect of increasing pressure? We have also established that the effect is that it will favor a decrease in volume. So let's look for the volumes of gases on both sides. For this first equation, we said before that there is two moles of gas, but I can take it as two volumes of gas. Avogadro's law permits me. This is one mole of gas. I can take it as one volume of gas. That means on the left, I have a total of three volumes of gas. Now on the right, what's the total volume of gas? Two volumes of gas. It means that for this reaction we are looking at, going forward, we meet a decrease in volume. A decrease from what to what? from three volumes to two volumes. Whereas coming backwards, we experience an increase in volume from two to three. So, since the forward reaction shows a decrease in volume from three to two, it will be favored by an increase in pressure. Whereas the backward reaction shows a decrease, sorry, an increase in volume from two to three. So that increase in volume will be favored by a decrease in pressure. What about this second case, this second reaction? Total volume of gas on the left, one volume. Total volume of gas on the right, two volumes. So going to the right, going forward, what is happening to volume of gas? It is increasing from what? One to two. Now, since the forward reaction is accompanied by an increase in volume, then that same forward reaction will be favored by a decrease in pressure. Whereas the backward reaction shows a decrease in volume and would therefore be favored by an increase in pressure. Try to work this one out 
and see what will be the effect of lowering the pressure. Of course, if you lower pressure, you favor increase in volume, which is the forward reaction. But just think about it. Now, that would be all for this um, first video on chemical equilibrium. By the second video, I'll write equilibrium constants and then do some calculations on chemical equilibrium. And from all indications, I think there will be a third video because what is left of chemical equilibrium may just take so much time that one video covering all of that will be too long. So I'll see you in the second chemical equilibrium video. Remember to subscribe, remember to share, remember to like. Tell your friends about this channel so that they too can be part of this life-changing experience. I'll see us by the next video.